In part A of topic one, we looked at the anatomy or structures of the eye. What we're gonna do now is look at the physiology. So we're gonna look at the function of those bits and pieces that make up the eye. We'll talk about how the lens is able to redirect light and focus it onto the retina. And we'll talk about the photoreceptive cells that receive photons of light and send information to the brain. So I've divided this into two parts. In the first part, we'll look at refraction. Refraction is the bending or redirection of light as it goes from one medium to another. So for instance, when light goes from air to glass, it can be refracted and redirected. And similarly, when light goes from air to the lens of your eye, it can be redirected. Then we'll talk about photoreception, which is what occurs in the rods and cones. So those are the photoreceptors within the retina. They will absorb photons and respond to that and send a signal to your brain. So the lens is going to use refraction to focus electromagnetic radiation onto the photoreceptive cells of the retina. Electromagnetic radiation comes in lots of forms. It includes microwaves, radio waves, ultraviolet, infrared, all sorts of stuff we can't see. The only portion we can see is a tiny little slice of the electromagnetic spectrum that we refer to as visible light, because of course that's what we can see. That's what our eyes have evolved to respond to. There are other creatures out there that can see things that we can't see. Uh, we can't see ultraviolet, but there's several insects that can see that. There are reptiles and insects and lots of other creatures that can see infrared as well. It'd be kind of cool if we could see some of that stuff. It'd be kind of interesting to know what the world would look like if we were able to see radio waves, for instance. I have no idea. Um, okay, photoreceptors, as I mentioned, come in two forms, rods and cones. They're different and they serve different functions. Rods are very sensitive to low levels of light and they allow us to see a grayscale image in a dimly lit room or out at night when it's dark. Cones come in three different types and they respond to three different wavelengths of light. That's where we get our color information from. So the different wavelengths of light are perceived as different colors. And the information from those cones is blended together to give us color information. And how that occurs is really quite fascinating. We'll spend a bit of time talking about that. Light is pretty quick. It moves at about 300,000 kilometers per second, if I remember correctly. And as it moves from one transparent medium to another, its speed changes very slightly. It slows down slightly as it goes into the denser medium. And it also is refracted, it's bent, it's redirected. You can see the figure in the top left there. We've got light that's hitting something at kind of a oblique angle. It's not hitting it perpendicularly. And that causes the light ray to change direction. Incidentally, if you're wondering what normal to boundary means, uh, normal just means perpendicular. Uh, I don't think that term's used a whole lot anymore in math classes in high school. But it uh, is going to be redirected as it moves from one medium to another. And you see this all the time. If you look at the example of the pencil in the glass there, the water and the glass have a similar density. Uh, the air and the pencil and the glass have different densities. So light that bounces off of the pencil, the part that's underwater, bounces back towards your eye through the water and then through the glass, but it doesn't change direction very much because the density of the water and the glass are similar. However, if we look at the part of the pencil that's above the water line, the light that bounces off of that pencil has to move through air and then through glass and then through air again to get to your eye, and it changes direction quite a bit. And that's why the pencil looks like it doesn't match up. Another thing to note is when we take light and we pass it through a convex lens, and I'll show you an example of this in just a moment, a convex lens is one that curves outwardly on both sides, like the lenses in our eyes, for instance. 
then the rays can be converged onto a focal point. So the light rays can be bent. They start out roughly parallel, but they can be bent and converge on each other to a focal point. The focal point is where the rays of light cross over. And again, I'll show you an image of that in just a second. So a convex lens can be used to form an image. As you're going to see, though, the image is going to be upside down and reversed. Light that enters the eye has to pass through several layers and structures. First of all, light has to pass through the cornea, the clear outer protective layer of the eye. Then through the aqueous humor, which is a very watery like substance between the cornea and the lens. After that, the light passes through the lens itself and then into the posterior chamber, which is filled with vitreous humor. And that's a very viscous, thick, gel-like uh, material. And then finally, the light has to pass through the sensory layer of the retina before striking a photoreceptor. Light is refracted along the way. Um, the most important source of refraction is, of course, the lens itself, but it is refracted at the cornea. That happens in everyone. If you have a misshapen cornea, the light may be refracted there more than it should be, and you won't form um, a proper image. That's known as astigmatism. Light is refracted very strongly as it enters the lens and also as it leaves the lens. And that's what you're seeing in this diagram here. Now, what you're seeing here are light rays, which are just tracings of the path that a hypothetical photon would take in the light that's hitting the lens. And if we look in the center of the lens, we look at this light ray here, this light ray is refracted very little. And that's because it's hitting the lens at pretty much a perpendicular angle. And that's because there's not too much curvature to the lens here. So the light hits here and the path of the light is perpendicular to the surface of the lens and it leaves the lens and again the path is pretty much perpendicular to the surface of the lens and the light is not really redirected. It just continues through in a straight line. But if we look up the top here, there's a lot of curvature here. And the light that hits the lens is redirected quite strongly. And as the light leaves the lens, it may be redirected again as well. So where there's more curvature, there's more refraction. And what happens with a convex lens, again, that's a lens that is going to curve outwardly on both sides, is the light is going to be converged. The rays are going to be converged. And we get to a point where the rays cross over. You can see that here, and that is called the focal point. Now in a, an eye that's functioning as it should, the photoreceptor cell should be located just behind that focal point. If we change the shape of the lens, let's say that we flatten it out. If we flatten it out, we don't get as much convergence. And if we kind of squish it, we get more curvature, we get more convergence. So changing the shape of the lens allows us to shift the focal point. And that is how we focus on objects that are close or objects that are far away. Let's take a look at how this works. So here we have an object, a giraffe, and it's located a long way away, let's say. And because it's so far away, light that bounces off of the giraffe towards our eyes is going to be traveling pretty much in parallel paths. So all the rays of light are going to be pretty much parallel for all intents and purposes. Now those rays of light, if they hit a convex lens, like the lens in a camera or the lens in your eye, those parallel rays are going to be converged. And again, the rays will cross over at the focal point. And if we have, let's say, a piece of film or a sensor or a retina a little ways behind that focal point, we can get a smaller and inverted upside down image being formed of that giraffe. 
So the image that's going to be formed is going to be much smaller. It's going to be focused on a much smaller area. It's going to be upside down as well. So the image that is formed by your eye on the retina is actually upside down. But we don't need to worry about that because your brain knows that and it immediately flips it back around. Uh, it figures it out without much difficulty. And just another view of the same thing. Just realize, of course, that the angles are quite exaggerated here. I mean, that tree is much bigger than your eyeball. It would be located very far away, presumably. Um, so those light rays, one, two, three, four, would be roughly parallel. But they've exaggerated things just because otherwise it would be difficult to interpret what's going on. But you can see these light rays, one, two, three, four, are being redirected by the curvature of the lens. They're passing through a focal point, and that's shown by the blue arrow. And that image is being inverted and projected in a much smaller size on the back of the eyeball, right at the macula. So if you look closely, you'll see a little depression in the middle there. That is the fovea, where most of your cones are located. Um, again, also, the focal point would be much closer to the retina. It would be kind of at the surface of the retina, and that tiny, tiny inverted image would be formed at the photoreceptive cells. Now, let's say that you're looking at something very far away. Maybe you've got a tennis ball 20 feet away from you. Light is bouncing off of that tennis ball and being collected by your eye. Of course, if there's no light, you can't see anything. So light is reflected from the top of the tennis ball. It's reflected from the bottom of the tennis ball and all points in between. And all of those rays are roughly parallel because it's very, very far away and the angles involved are very, very small. All of these diagrams exaggerate uh, the angles just so you can see them more clearly. But if we're looking at something far away, like you see in this diagram here, the rays come in roughly parallel and they don't need much redirection to form an image at the retina. So the lens doesn't need a lot of curvature to redirect roughly parallel rays of light through a focal point. In this diagram here, the black dot at the back represents the focal point where the converging um, rays are going to cross over. And notice again, it's just in front of the retina. We'll compare this to what happens if you're looking at something very close um, in just a moment. But one thing to point out is the lens will not change shape further as something gets further and further away from you past 20 feet or 6.1 meters. And those of you that are into photography probably realize that if you use the manual focus, there's a setting there that says infinity. And infinity is basically anything beyond uh, 20 feet. So in a camera, you're moving the lens. You're not changing the shape of the lens, but you're moving the lens. And if something is beyond 20 feet, um, the rays are pretty much parallel. There's very little adjustment that needs to be done to form an image. And the same thing happens in the eye. Again, the take home message, if a light ray is coming in and it's perpendicular to the surface of the lens, we get very little refraction. We get very little uh, redirection. But as that angle changes more and more, due to curvature, we get more refraction. So we get more refraction towards the outside of the lens, especially if the lens is more spherical. So we're looking at something distant. Um, the rays are pretty much parallel. It doesn't take a lot of redirection to focus them. But if we're looking at something very, very near, again, if you're holding a tennis ball right in front of your face, the rays that are coming off of that object are diverging quite a bit and they're hitting the lens at a fairly extreme angle and they need to be adjusted quite a lot to bring the image into focus. So we need more curvature. We need more um, converging power, I guess you could say, to form an image for something that is close. A couple other things need to happen if you're looking at something close to you. 
So I'll use that example again of the tennis ball. Let's say you have a tennis ball and you're holding it at arm's length. And then what you're going to do is move the tennis ball in until it touches your nose. As you do that, a few things are going to happen. First of all, you have something called accommodation happening. Accommodation is the changing of the shape of the lens. The lens has to ch change shape. As the tennis ball gets closer, the lens is going to get more and more round uh, because it needs more curvature to redirect those diverging rays of light and converge them to form a sharp image on the retina. The other thing that's going to happen is your left and right eye are going to start to converge. And what I mean by that is they're going to start to point medially. As an object gets closer and closer and closer to you, you go cross-eyed. And that is convergence. And finally, there's constriction. Um, this is a, a pupillary reflex, reflex. Remember, the pupil is the opening in the iris. The pupil will constrict. And this is done to prevent divergent light rays from entering the eye. So if we have something very close at the end of your nose, um, there's going to be a huge divergence of the light rays that are coming towards your eye. They can't all be accommodated for. They can't all be redirected to form an image. And what happens is the pupil is going to close down to get rid of any of these extremely divergent rays. It's just going to allow the ones in that aren't quite as divergent, that aren't coming in at crazy angles. Uh, this is what happens in a camera as well. If you, again, are a photographer or you have some interest in SLRs and manual cameras, you'll know that you can change the iris. You can change the diameter of the iris, just like your eye would. If you're photographing something very close, you want to close down that iris. So accommodation is the change in shape of the lens. And how it works is maybe a little bit counterintuitive. We have the ciliary body that contains ciliary muscles, and those pull on strands, typically called suspensory ligaments, although there's also structures in there called zonules. Um, I'm just going to refer to them as suspensory ligaments. So the suspensory ligaments are, are kind of like cables that attach the eye to the ciliary muscle. When you're looking at something distant, the lens is relaxed. Those muscles in the ciliary body are relaxed. There's a little bit of tension in the suspensory ligaments. If you're looking at something close, what's going to happen is the suspensory ligaments here, and I'll try to draw these in red, over here and over here are going to contract. As they do that, the other suspensory ligaments you can see towards the anterior are kind of relaxing. So now we've got differential forces on the lens and it's going to cause the lens to become misshapen. It's going to make the lens more spherical. It never becomes completely spherical um, in, in humans. Actually, in aquatic animals like fish, the lens is very spherical. I'll let you think about why that might be. But in humans, it's going to cause the lens to become closer to a sphere. And that increases curvature. So especially on the back of the eye, look at the back of the eye here. So this surface here, here, is much more strongly curved than it was when we were looking at something distant. So we've increased the curvature, which increases the refractive power of the lens. Convergence, once again, is just the very simple idea that as something comes closer to you, your eyes have to converge medially to look at it. And that's important because that's one of the indicators your brain uses to figure out how close something is to you. It's not something you need to think about, but it's something your brain is monitoring. Your brain is telling you, I'm looking at that tree very far away, 
and both my eyes are pointed in the same direction. So the direction that my eyes are pointed in is parallel. Your brain knows that that object is far away. Now you're looking at something that's maybe only four feet away. Your eyes are slightly converged when you're looking at something four feet away. It's very slight. If you wouldn't notice it if you were looking at someone, uh, you wouldn't notice it yourself, but your brain notices it. And that gives you an indication as to how far away that object is. And as a, something becomes much closer, of course, the convergence is much more pronounced. So what can go wrong with the eye? Unfortunately, lots of stuff. Talked about astigmatism already. That's where the cornea is misshapen and it's causing more refraction than it should, more refraction than the lens can deal with. We have things like macular degeneration, which unfortunately uh, my father has. My father is legally blind. Macular degeneration is where the cells of the macula, the photoreceptive cells and the support cells degenerate or where you have excess fluid uh, seeping out of blood vessels in that area and causing problems. In macular degeneration, you've got a spot in the middle of your vision, and it can grow to take up almost all of your field of view where you can't see anything. So you just see bits at the periphery. And then more commonly, we have problems with accommodation. So the lens cannot be accommodated fully. And these problems become more prevalent as we age and the lens loses elasticity and so on. So these are problems that you need glasses to correct. So in nearsightedness, you're unable to focus on distant objects. This is known as a myopia, um, but I'm not gonna actually test you on, on these terms specifically. In myopia, the lens forms a focal point that is too far forward. So it's quite a ways forward from the retina. In hyperopia, uh, this is farsightedness, you're unable to focus on close objects. So in this case, the focal point is at the back of the retina. It's actually beyond the retina. It never quite happens. Now this can be corrected for using lenses and you can see that we use different types of lenses to correct for this and what the lenses do is they ensure that the light rays are coming in at an angle that your lens can deal with so again the problem here is that the lens cannot change shape sufficiently to provide a sharp image recall that the external muscles of the eye the muscles that attach to the sclera are known as the extrinsic muscles and they move the eye around so you can look around without actually moving your head. They're innervated by three cranial nerves and if there's problems with any of those cranial nerves you won't be able to contract the muscle it innervates and you won't be able to move your eye appropriately. So there's fairly simple tests to see if there's problems with those muscles or with cranial nerves, you can just have a patient follow your finger around in a circle basically and figure out what nerve is damaged if that's the case. Something I find quite fascinating, but I don't expect you to know in uh, a whole lot of detail, is the fact that the nerves that innervate the extrinsic eye muscles are also tied into centers of the brain that are connected to the vestibular system of the ear. And if you remember, within the inner ear, we have these fluid-filled semicircular canals that can detect movement and acceleration. You don't need to think about this, but if you're rotating your head while you're looking at something important, your eyes will remain fixed on that object. So your head turns, your eyes have to turn in the opposite direction. And this is all due to wiring that uh, you don't have a whole lot of control over. Your brain will keep track of where your head is, what you want to look at, and it will make all the appropriate movements. All right, so we've looked at how the lens is going to redirect light towards the retina so that we have an image 
forming at the retina. Now we'll look at what happens in the retina. We'll look at the process of photoreception, which is the detection of light energy. Rods and cones are photoreceptors and they contain photopigments and photopigments absorb light. So let's say, for instance, you are wearing a red shirt and you're standing out on your front yard in the sunshine. The sunlight that hits you contains every possible wavelength of visible light. It contains yellow and orange and red and green and etc. The pigment in your shirt absorbs everything except red. So that white light hits your shirt. The white light is a mixture of all the different colors. Everything is absorbed except for the red. The red is reflected. So if you have a friend next to you looking at your shirt, they see your shirt as red because that's the only light that's bouncing off of it and going to their eyes. And again, that's because of the pigment in your shirt. So a pigment is something that absorbs a certain wavelength or a certain range of wavelengths of light. The photopigments that are embedded within the uh, rods and cones are found within the sac-like structures. So we have these sacs of uh, phospholipid that contain pigment, and these are infoldings of the surface. What I mean by that is basically the sacs are little bits of the membrane that are pushed inwards. And we have lots and lots of these pigments that can absorb photons and bring about a change in the cell that is going to initiate eventually an action potential that gets back to the brain. Let's take a look at the structure of the rods and cones. So these are individual cells and you can see probably how they get their name. Rods are roughly rod shaped and cones have kind of a conical point at the top. But notice the discs. So the discs again are made up of phospholipid membrane with these photopigments embedded in them. So as these cells develop, they basically become very, very wrinkly on top and that gives rise to these stacks of membranes. And in the rod, those stacks move entirely inward and become engulfed by the cell. At the bottom, notice that we have the synaptic terminal and that's going to connect to other excitable cells, as we'll see, or cells that can be inhibited. The synaptic terminals contain synaptic vesicles that contain neurotransmitters that can be released and elicit a response in the cell that these guys are interacting with. So rods contain more discs, as you can see, and that's why they're more sensitive to light. If a photon of light comes towards a rod, it's more likely to be captured. So keep in mind, a lot of the photons of light might just pass right through these cells. They have to hit one of these photopigments and they have to hit that molecule just right. There's a higher chance of that happening in a rod because there's more discs and there's more photopigment. Cones, not as sensitive because there aren't that many discs. Uh, but cones can respond to different wavelengths. We have three different types of cones that are receptive to three different ranges of wavelength. And again, that gives us our color information. This diagram shows how these photoreceptors are arranged within the retina. So at the top here, this is the back of the retina. Beyond that, we would have the choroid. At the top here, we have these pigmented cells, this pigment or pigmented epithelium. And this epithelium contains melanin, contains lots of melanin. Melanin is a pigment that's very dark in color and it absorbs pretty much all wavelengths of visible light. So any photons that manage to get through the photoreceptors, they're gonna be absorbed by that epithelium. They're gonna hit a melanin molecule and be absorbed. And I've mentioned this, I think a couple times now, but that's going to prevent the photons from bouncing back out into the eye and bouncing around in the eye and giving off all these kind of false signals that will give us kind of a, a cloudy image. 
Note that the cones and the rods are actually surrounded by these little projections that come off of the epithelium. The epithelium does more than just absorb stray photons of light. It actually helps nourish and support the rods and cones, and it plays a big role actually in the development of those cells. And it's thought that a lot of deficiencies in the eye, some forms of macular degeneration, for instance, might be related to problems with those pigment cells. They're not doing their job uh, maintaining the health of the photoreceptors. At the other end, at the bottom here, notice that the rods and cones are in contact with bipolar cells. There's synapses between the photoreceptor cells and the bipolar cells. Now on the right, we've got a close-up of a few of those discs in a rod. And again, the discs are going to contain these photopigments. And you're seeing a close-up of that down the bottom there in part B. These photopigments are made up of two bits, two molecules. There's a very big molecule known as opsin, and this is uh, found together with something called retinol. So this retinol is loosely bound to this opsin. This retinol molecule is rather important. And also don't get too confused by the name. If I ask you on a test to define retinol, I don't mean having to do with the retina. Um, I'm, I'm talking about this specific protein here. This protein is what actually will absorb the photon of light. And when it absorbs a photon of light, it changes shape. And that little um, event is what gets the whole ball rolling. So retinal absorbing a photon of light and changing shape is what brings about the response that's required for, for vision. Rod cells and cone cells consist of three separate regions which are structurally and functionally quite different. So we have the outer segment, as you can see on this diagram here, and that contains the discs that have the photopigments. Below that, we have the inner segment, which contains kind of the guts of the cell, I guess you could say. That's where the mitochondria are mostly located. That's where we have the rough ER and the smooth ER and the Golgi. Uh, lots of activity there. That's where a lot of energy is being liberated and also where proteins and lipids are being manufactured to maintain the cell. Underneath that, we've got the nucleus. And then underneath that, we've got the synaptic terminals that are going to interact with bipolar cells. These cells are very, very active. They're very energetic cells. And if you remember, the pigment cells, the pigment epithelium would be at the top here, and there would be appendages that come off of those cells and wrap around that outer segment. And they're feeding that cell with nourishment, with metabolites and so on. The discs actually wear out. So over time, they will wear out and the old ones at the top are discarded and new ones are made at the bottom of that outer segment. So down here, we have new discs that are forming and they will migrate upwards as the ones at the top are shed and actually pulled off by the pigment cells digested, broken down. So the pigment cells are really important for maintaining that outer segment. If something goes wrong in the pigment cells, then these rod cells and the cone cells can't regenerate damaged and useless discs. And that's when we start to run into problems. So that's thought to be rather important when it comes to uh, disorders like macular degeneration. So rods, we'll look at those first. Rods are very sensitive to dim light, and that's because they have lots and lots of these discs and lots and lots of photopigment that could potentially absorb a photon. Rods respond equally to all wavelengths of visible light. They don't distinguish between them. The output that you get from rods alone is in gray tones. We don't get any color information because, again, they indiscriminately will respond to photons of different wavelengths. The way they're wired up to the ganglion cells is different as well. So generally we have several rods that feed into a single ganglion cell. Now imagine we have like 20 rods, they feed into one ganglion cell. 
if one of those rods receives a photon of light, that will fire off that ganglion cell and it will send information back to the brain. But because we have many, many rods, so a fairly large surface area feeding into one cell ultimately, we get, I guess the best way to think of this is really big pixels. Uh, we get big pixels, we don't get high resolution, um, and it gives us a, a blurrier image. So if you're walking around at night, on a dark night, first of all, you don't see color, but also the image quality is rather poor. The rods are found throughout the retina, with the exception of the fovea centralis. So we don't really see many rods in that area. And there's a lot more rods than there are cones. There's 20 times more rods than we have cones. Cones come in three flavors or three types. So we have cones that respond predominantly to the red section of the spectrum. So they respond to photons that have a wavelength that falls into the red portion of the visible spectrum. We have other cones that respond to green most strongly, and we have other cones that respond to blue wavelengths. Cones require more photons to be activated. They don't have as many disks. They don't have as much of that photo pigment. The cones feed into a single ganglion cell. So instead of having many rods, feeding into one ganglion cell. Now we have this one-to-one -one ratio between cones and ganglion cells. So what does that mean? Our pixels in our image that's formed in our brain are smaller. We have more pixels, we get better resolution. So we get high resolution or high acuity uh, images being formed. The cones are found predominantly in the macula and especially in the fovea, which is pretty much entirely cones. So what you're seeing on the right here is a mixture of these three different cones and some rods. And this is what we would see in the macula and just outside the macula, we would have cones and rods commingling. This diagram does a really nice job of showing us the distribution of rods and cones in the retina. So let's take a few minutes and kind of break this down here. So the diagram on the left there is showing you the arrangement of the retina. And let's imagine uh, a ray of light that passes straight through the center of the lens. And I'm gonna try to draw this here. It doesn't work very well, but imagine we have a straight line coming down here. That's roughly straight. Going straight through the lens, it will hit the fovea centralis in the center of the macula. And we're gonna set that as zero degrees. Now, as we go away, from that central point, angles are going to increase. So if I draw a line from here to here, this degree, this angle in here should be about 40 degrees. The chart on the right, what they've done is they've taken the retina and they flattened it out. And the angles that you see here are angles away from the fovea. So 10 degrees away from the fovea in each direction, 20 degrees, etc. Now note that the optic nerve doesn't leave right at the back of the eye, it's off center a bit. So the optic nerve leaves here and where the optic nerve leaves, there is no retina, there are no photoreceptive cells. So we can't form an image uh, in that part of the eye and that's the blind spot. So again, looking at the diagram, just imagine we're taking the retina and we're flattening it out. You can see that we have lots of cones in the fovea. In fact, that's where most of them are. And the macula luteae, which is just around that. So the cones are shown in red, very high concentration within the fovea. And also within the macula luteae. So the macula luteae would be kind of in here. Now to the right on the chart, we've also got the blind spot. The blind spot is where the optic nerve is leaving the eye. There are no receptors there at all. There are no cones and there are no rods. Now take a look at the rods in blue. 
you can see the highest distribution is around 20, 15 uh, degrees away from the, uh, the fovea, but of course outside that blind spot, and then it drops off towards the outside. But notice that there's pretty much no cones. We have very, very few cones outside of the macula. I mentioned this in part A, but I do find it quite fascinating all the layers that light has to pass through to get to the photoreceptive cells that are going to absorb photons. So light is passing through from the left here. That would be the posterior segment. And it's passing through some fine blood vessels, some fine capillaries that are found on the inner surface of the retina. It's passing through the axons of the ganglion cells, it's passing through the ganglion cells, it's passing through the bipolar cells, and eventually gets to those photoreceptive cells. The photoreceptive cells, the rods and cones, are going to send a signal to a bipolar cell that then sends a signal to the ganglion cell, and the axon at the end of that ganglia cell goes to the, um, the brain. It goes all the way to the brain, which is pretty incredible. Those are very, very long extensions that come off of those ganglion cells. So in this diagram here on the left, the light is going from left to right. The signal that gets back to the brain is going in the opposite direction from right to left. Nice image here of the histology as it actually looks under a microscope and you should hopefully have a chance to see this in lab. Uh, but you can see that we have a lot of stuff between the posterior segment and the actual photoreceptive cells that light has to pass through. Ultimately, at a molecular level, the way cones and rods work is similar. We have these pigments that consist of retinal and opsin, and the retinal is the protein, the molecule that changes shape and starts the ball rolling. But as I've mentioned, rods have a type of retinal and opsin that will respond to all photons, whereas cones specifically respond to uh, three different ranges of wavelength. So the blue range, the green range, and the red range. There are, of course, other colors out there and your brain will interpret the proportions of blue, green, and red cones that are being stimulated to come up with what it thinks the color actually is. So let's say we have, I don't know, 20 blue cones being triggered, and we have 10 green cones being triggered. Well, the color's not blue, it's aqua. It's kind of a mixture of the two. And we'll come back to this in a lot more detail in just one second. Because of the way human eyes work, we can express any color on a TV screen, for instance, on your phone, by using some combination of red, green, and blue. So imagine that we have a piece of paper or a cloth in front of us that's bright white and very reflective and we shine a green spotlight onto it, a red spotlight, and a blue spotlight. Where those spotlights overlap, we will perceive that area as white. And that's because that area will be reflecting green, red, and blue light towards us. And it will activate the green, red, and blue cones. And your brain will interpret that as white light. Now remember, white light the light that comes from the sun, for instance, is actually a mixture of all the different colors, not just green, red, and blue. But that's all your mind cares about. That's all your cones care about. Your cones can only detect green, red, and blue. So if it gets all of those, it will assume that you are seeing the entire spectrum and you're seeing white light. If we're only seeing green and red, it'll perceive that as yellow. And we can have any combination, uh, it's proportional. So we can have a lot of green, a little bit of red, a little bit of blue, that will be interpreted as a color by your brain. So what I suggest you should do is take a close look at your TV 
you have a TV, uh, preferably a widescreen one, go up and take a look at it closely. And what you'll see are that the pixels on your TV are divided into three sections, three sub uh, pixels. So I'll just uh, try to outline one of these here. So we've got this here, and again, it's really tough to draw on here. But each pixel consists of a red part, a green part, and a blue part. If the blue part is emitting blue light and the other two are turned off, you'll see that pixel is blue. Likewise, if only green is turned on, you'll see that is green. If only red is turned on, you'll see that is red. If red and green are turned on and the blue one's off, you'll see that is yellow. Once again, we can have different proportions of each of those colors. If you look on a computer image editing software, like paint or something like that, you know that you can pick colors by inputting three ranges, one through 255 for the green, and the same for the red and the same for the blue. You can determine the intensity of each of those colors. That will be interpreted, that mixture will be interpreted as a certain color by your cones. But again, I just want to emphasize that this works because our brain is just sensitive to those three colors. And I want you to wrap your head around this scenario. Imagine that we make contact with some alien life form. And uh, they're very friendly and we want to share our tech with them. And we show them a TV screen. But let's say that they've evolved cones that are sensitive to yellow, green, and violet. If they see yellow, green, and violet, they, uh, their brain interprets that as all the colors of the rainbow and they interpret that as white. What would happen if they looked at our TV screens? They wouldn't work for them. So TV screens are basically a form of trickery. Um, when you see a white pixel, your brain is convinced that all the colors are there, even though they're actually not. And in the lab, uh, what I'll try to do for the Quinell students is I'll set up a dissecting microscope. It's a bit more difficult to do this year with COVID stuff, but we'll put a cell phone under that and you'll see the same kind of structure in your cell phone. Uh, and that's something for the um, PG students. I mean, you can try that yourself at home. Like I said, have a quick look at your TV close up. You can take your phone, put it under a magnifying glass uh, and see the structure of the pixels with these three sub pixels. Again, we have three categories of cones and they have different opsins. Now that is the largest part of the photopigment. The retinal is a smaller molecule that's attached to that, but the opsins are actually responsible for initially capturing the photon and passing it on to the retinal molecule. We have these different opsins and by no means do I expect you to know the names of these opsins, but the opsins respond to different ranges of wavelengths. A certain opsin will be able to grab a certain photon of a certain wavelength and they'll pass that on to the retinal. So you can see the, uh, the ranges that they respond to, and it is a range, but the ranges are basically centered in the blue, green, and red. It's important to remember when you look at something, the light that you're seeing is being bounced off that object to your eyes. So again, if we have someone that's standing out in the sunshine, the sun is emitting all the different wavelengths of light. We're perceiving that as white light. That white light is bouncing off the object you're looking at. Some of the wavelengths are gonna be absorbed whatever isn't absorbed is going to be reflected to your eye. So there's two things going on here. We have to consider what's being absorbed by the subject that you're looking at. And then we have to consider what is coming back to your eyes, what's being reflected and how that's being interpreted by your cones. And when we talk about colors and how they're produced, we can talk about additive mixing which involves mixing different colors of light together. And we can talk about subtractive 
mixing, which involves pigments. That's what you're used to, you know, in primary school with paints. So that diagram there in the lower left shows additive mixing of light. I'm not showing mixing paints together. Paints are pigments, they absorb stuff. I'm talking about mixing light together. We're mixing three pure uh, colors of light from a spotlight together to get white light. So green, red, and blue, again, will be perceived as white light, even though a lot of other wavelengths are missing. So that's additive mixing. But then we have subtractive mixing, which doesn't apply to mixing light, it applies to mixing pigments. So go back to my example of the red shirt. You're out there on your lawn, white light is hitting your shirt, and uh, we can see that example right here. Your shirt is absorbing green and blue, and probably a lot of other things as well, but it's not absorbing red and the red is going to be reflected and the red is going to get to your eye and the red is going to stimulate the red cones but the blue cones and the green cones they've got nothing to work with they won't be stimulated uh, you're going to perceive that shirt as red if you're wearing a black shirt it means all the white light has been absorbed and again it doesn't actually have to mean that but it means at least the red, green, and blue are being absorbed because that's all your eyes care about. If you're wearing a white shirt, all of that light, or at least the blue, green, and red are being reflected and that's what you are seeing. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, think on this for a while. I find it really quite amazing how the human eye works and how we're able to trick the eye. Uh, how we were able to make things like television screens. So again, just one last time here, additive mixing refers to mixing light, mixing light of different colors, like what happens on your TV screen. Subtractive mixing refers to mixing pigments. And remember, pigments absorb light. So a red pigment absorbs everything but red, a yellow pigment absorbs everything but yellow, a blue pigment absorbs everything but blue. You mix them all together, the resulting pigment, so the paint that you've created by putting those three paints together, absorbs everything. And then nothing reflects off of that mixture. Nothing gets to your eyes and you see it as black, which is of course the absence of light, the absence of color. So another example of subtractive mixing would be the ink cartridge in your computer printer. Your cartridge contains three types of ink, magenta, cyan, and yellow. And when you print something for every pixel on that picture, the computer is gonna figure out how much of the magenta pigment should be included, how much of the cyan, how much of the yellow to get the appropriate color. But again, it all comes down to the fact that we can perceive red, blue, and green. And we can, um, in this case, mix pigments together to get different proportions of those three colors reflected from the, uh, the page that results. So in humans, we have this trichromatic color perception based on the proportion of red, green, and blue cones that are stimulated. This isn't the way it works in, in all animals. Um, in some animals, the ranges for the different cones can be different because they have different options. But in us, if we have equal proportions of red, green, and blue cones being stimulated, then we're gonna get white. If it's only red, we get red. If it's red and green, we might get orange, but what if red and green are not stimulated in the same proportions? We have more green than red and still no blue, we might get yellow, etc. So you compose colors in your brain based on the proportion of stimulation of these three different cones. It might be 10% red and 70% green, 
and no blue. And I'm not sure what that would give you, but that would give you a specific color. Some insects can actually see infrared and UV. I mentioned that before. What you're seeing here on the left is a flower as it would appear to us. What you see on the right is a picture that's taken with a camera that's sensitive to UV. One of the cool things about cameras is they can be designed to have receptors that are receptive to whatever wavelength we want to manufacture them to be receptive to. This camera is showing patterns that are only really visible in UV light. They're not visible to us, but they are visible to bees. Quite often on flowers, there's markings, almost like arrows, that point towards the middle where the nectar is. So bees see the world quite differently from us. And of course, flowers aren't there for us. They're there for the bees. So the bees get a lot of extra information that we don't get. Let's have a look at what's happening at the molecular level. So let's take a look at what's happening in these photoreceptor cells. Things work a little differently than you might think. You might expect that, okay, the photosensors are going to absorb a photon of light and that's gonna cause the release of neurotransmitter and that's gonna activate the bipolars um, and that's gonna activate the ganglion cells and then we're gonna get a, a signal sent. That would be intuitive, that would make sense. Unfortunately, things are a bit more complicated than that. What's usually happening in the dark is that the photosensors are sending an inhibitory neurotransmitter across the gap, across the synaptic cleft to the bipolar cells, and they're inhibiting the bipolar cells. So that's what's normally happening. If a photosensor absorbs a photon of light, that stops happening, and then the bipolar cell can send off an action potential and trigger a ganglion cell. Rhodopsin is the photopigment that's found in rod cells. And there's a slight variation of this that's found in the different cone cells. Within a single rod, we have about a thousand disks and each one of those contains about 80,000 molecules of rhodopsin. So we have lots of targets that a photon could potentially hit. The photon is going to hit the, um, the opsin, and that is going to cause the retinal protein to change shape. So rhodopsin is made up of opsin and it's made up of retinal. And this is derived from vitamin A. And you've probably heard before that, you know, you'll never see a rabbit wearing glasses um, because uh, you know, they eat a lot of carrots. Carrots contain a lot of vitamin A. So yeah, actually eating carrots could potentially be good for your eyesight. However, it's not necessarily that good for your rabbit. I had a pet rabbit for 13 years. He was litter trained. He came when he was called and ran around like a cat, basically. Um, don't feed your rabbits too many carrots. It makes them fat because they're full of sugar too. Okay, I don't know why I went there. But anyway, so Retinol normally exists in what's called a cis isomer, and that just means that it has a kink in it. So it's a long molecule and it's got a kink in its shape. But if it absorbs a photon of light passed to it by the um, opsin, it'll be converted to its trans form, which just means it straightens out. And you don't need to know any more detail than that. Just know that the absorption of a photon of light will change the shape of the protein retinol. And that change is going to initiate a whole bunch of reactions that will lead to the splitting of the opsin and the retinol. The retinol will actually be released. And this is a, a process known as bleaching. That retinol has to be reshaped back to its cis form and then reattached to another opsin before that photopigment can do anything before that photopigment can become active again. So every single time a photon of light is absorbed, this photopigment breaks down into its two constituent parts and they need to be put back together. This 
is a scary diagram. I'll admit it, there's a bit more information here than you need to know. But I'll walk you through the steps and I'll tell you what's important. So what we're seeing here is the phospholipid membrane that makes up part of one of the discs in a photoreceptive cell. On the left, you can see that we have a photopigment and it consists of an opsin molecule, which is a protein attached to a smaller retinal molecule. And at this point in time, the retinal molecule is in its cis form, which means it's bent. You can see this tail, this long tail on that molecule is bent. Now we have light coming in. We have a photon of light coming in. And that photon is going to bring in a bit of energy into that opsin, which is going to be passed to the retinal. And the retinal is going to change shape. It's going to become transretinal, which means it's straightened out. It's lost that kink. When that happens, the retinal is released from the opsin. Now the opsin at this point becomes active. It can do things. It couldn't do anything before. That retinal that was attached to it was blocking an active site. And the opsin was all ready to go, but the retinal was blocking that active site so that it couldn't do anything. So the retinal, retinal molecule is going to be released and now the opsin can activate something known as transducin. This protein is an enzyme and it's going to catalyze another molecule that will remove something known as cyclic GMP from sodium channels. And this is where there's a bit more detail than you need to know. Cyclic GMP is a common signaling molecule. And in this case, it needs to be bound to these specialized sodium channels in order for them to operate. If you take the cyclic GMP away, the sodium channels close. So what I want you to know is that opsin, when it absorbs light energy, it passes that energy on to the retinal, the retinal changes shape and it leaves. And then the opsin is going to ultimately activate the removal of cyclic GMP from the sodium channels. And that's going to cause the sodium channels to close. So those two or three sentences that I said there, that's a really nice summary of what's going on. If you remember back to 111, sodium channels let sodium into a cell. When sodium moves into a cell, they call the cell, cause the cell to depolarize. So remember nerve cells and other excitable cells uh, bring sodium in and that initiates the production of an action potential in most cases. So normally sodium is coming in, but as soon as we have the absorption of a photon of light, sodium stops coming in. And what happens is we get a hyperpolarization, which just means that the cell is less likely to trigger. It's less likely to send off an action potential. Now what's kind of weird is that up to this point in the dark, these photoreceptors have been sending off action potentials and they've been causing the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters that inhibit the activity of the next cell in the chain of events. Okay, so let's look at that again in a bit more detail perhaps. On the left here, we've got a photoreceptor that's in the dark. At the top there, we've got cyclic GMP that's being produced all the time and it's binding to sodium channels and it's keeping them open. The sodium channels are letting sodium come in. That is causing um, depolarization of the cell. The depolarization of the cell is going to activate voltage gated calcium channels. These channels will open they allow calcium to enter the cell. The calcium will bind to vesicles that contain neurotransmitter and it's an, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. If you recall from 111 and if you don't, maybe go back and review your notes briefly, but calcium will bind to vesicles and allow the vesicles to bind to the synaptic terminal and release their contents. If there's no calcium, 
then those vesicles can't bind to the membrane and they can't release the neurotransmitter. But once again, the neurotransmitter that's being released is inhibitory. It's actually going to hyperpolarize the bipolar cells and stop them from firing. So normally in the dark, these photoreceptor cells are active. They're generating um, a membrane potential that causes the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters that inhibits the bipolar cells. Now what happens when we get some light? So we turn on the lights, we have photons now that will hit that photoreceptive pigment, cause the release of retinal, cause opsin to become active. Opsin will uh, catalyze a series of events that will remove cyclic GMP from the sodium channels, the sodium channels shut down, we don't have this membrane potential being produced, and that means the voltage-gated calcium channels are going to close, calcium doesn't come in, neurotransmitter can't be released, and the bipolar cells can't be inhibited. Now the bipolar cells can send a signal. So it really is kind of a complex, somewhat backwards way of doing things. So what happens next? Well, generally the bipolar cells are all ready to fire and release neurotransmitters, but they can't because they're being held back by the inhibitory effects of rods and cones if they're in the dark. Rods and cones aren't in the dark anymore. They will shut down and stop inhibiting the bipolar cells so they can do their job and fire off a signal. They will release neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft between the bipolar cell and the ganglion cell, and the ganglion cell will then fire. And remember, the ganglion cell has a very long axon attached to it. The axons of all the ganglion cells are bundled together as they leave the eye into the optic nerve, and that goes to the brain. And ultimately, those inputs are going to reach the uh, occipital lobe, so the back portion of the brain. That's where we form images and where we kind of manipulate that information. Bleaching is the process by which retinal is disassociated or removed from opsin. And this has to happen in order for uh, rods and cones to stop inhibiting bipolar cells. But in order for that photopigment to work again, the retinal that's lost has to be reshaped and then it has to be reattached to the opsin. So let's just look at the cycle that's occurring in this diagram. We have our cis retinal, our bent retinal molecule that's attached to the opsin. We have a photon of light coming in. That's going to cause the retinal to change shape to transretinal and then be lost. Again, that's the bleaching process. There's an enzyme, actually there's a few enzymes involved, we won't get into that, that will take the retinal molecule, reshape it back to cis retinal, and then stick it back to an opsin. But imagine that you are in a bright light situation. Let's say you're in a dark room, you're using only your rods, and then you walk into a very bright room all of a sudden. What's gonna happen? Well, the rods are very sensitive. They're going to absorb lots of photons of light. All of the retinal is going to be converted from cis to trans and detached from the opsins. And now for a brief period of time, you have no opsins that can do anything because that needs to be recycled. That retinal needs to be recycled and reattached to an opsin. So this bleaching leaves you with an instant where you can't form an image very well. Your eyes have to adapt to the light. Let's talk about adaptation, this time to light levels. So when I used the word adaptation before, I was talking about changes in the shape of the lens for changing the focal length. Now I'm talking about the adaptation of the eye to sudden changes in light level. So imagine as I just talked about, that you're in a dark room and you're going into a light room. Or perhaps you're lying in bed in a dark room and some, uh, I was going to use a bad word there, but some not so nice person 
walks in and switches on the light. Terrible thing to do first thing in the morning. If that happens, you're going to be overwhelmed by this sudden influx of photons. And what that's going to do is it's going to bleach the retinal from the photopigments in your rods. So the rods are very sensitive. They're very good at collecting photons. But if they're suddenly exposed to bright light, they're going to lose all of that retinal. Uh, the opsin is going to be activated as well. So you're going to get this sudden flash of inputs into your brain that will be interpreted as a very annoying bright light. And then the rods can't do anything because they have to recycle that retinal before the photopigment becomes active again. So the cones will start doing their job. The cones are less sensitive. They'll give you this high acuity, high resolution vision. And the rods will remain mostly shut down because again, they're being overwhelmed by the bright light. Now let's say we do the reverse. Let's say we go from a bright room into a dark room. You know that right away you won't be able to see anything. You'll be tripping over stuff. And the reason for that is your cones have been doing all the work in the bright room and all of the retinal has been bleached from your rods. You get into the dark room, the cones will effectively stop doing anything because there's not enough photons for them to be active. And the rods will need a fraction of a second to recycle all of that retinal so that they can actually you know, help you form images and stop you from tripping over stuff. The other thing we should look at is how this whole system is wired. It's different when we're looking at cones versus rods. So in the fovea centralis, where we have pretty much just cones, each of those cones connects to one bipolar cell that connects to one ganglion cell. So if we have one cone that's triggered, it will ultimately send a signal to the brain. The one beside it might not be triggered and it won't send a signal to the brain. This gives us really high resolution and I like to use the analogy, although it's not entirely accurate, of pixels. Uh, we get smaller pixels from the cones because of this one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one connection. Now if we look at the rods, especially the rods on the periphery, we have many, many rods, sometimes even hundreds of rods, that connect to one bipolar cell. This gives us a larger receptive field. So the receptive field refers to kind of the surface area of sensory cells that are connected to the system that will ultimately carry a signal back to the brain. We get bigger pixels. We get fuzzier resolution. So our resolution is lowered quite a bit. However, at the same time, it makes that receptive field more sensitive because now let's say we've got 200 rods there. If just one of them, or maybe a couple of them, are triggered, that's enough to send a signal. That's enough to uh, activate the bipolar cell and allow it to send a signal to the ganglion cell and onto the brain. So the way that rods and cones are wired also has a lot to do with how sensitive they are. Rods are more sensitive, but we get bigger pixels and fuzzier images. We'll talk briefly about how the information gets from the retina to the brain. So remember that the ganglion cells, their axons are going to be bundled together. They're going to form the optic nerve, which is odd in that it's hollow and had, has blood vessels within it, but it is a cranial nerve. It's a nerve that goes directly to the brain, so it attaches directly to the brain. The axons within the optic nerve, some of them, half of them, are going to cross at the optic chiasm. And just a little note here might help you in the future to pronounce certain words. If you see CH at the beginning of a biological term or a chemistry term in some cases, it comes from Greek typically. And in the Greek language, CH is pronounced as a hard K. So the optic chiasm, um, chimera, chelating agent, these are all things that start with CH. Anyway, that was a bit of an aside. So the optic chiasm is where 
some of the fibers cross over and we have information from the right field of view ultimately going to the left occipital lobe and vice versa. So we have crossing over of information. I'll show you a diagram of this in just a moment. And you might be surprised to learn that visual information is not processed at the front of the brain, it's processed at the back of the brain. The far back of the brain, the occipital lobe is located under the occipital bone of the skull. So if you have an injury to the back of the head, you have a, a blow to the back of the head, that can potentially blind you or at least uh, damage your visual perceptions. So we have these axons that lead into the brain. They travel through the optic nerve and then the optic track. So the optic track is just a highway of axons within the brain tissue, so surrounded by other tissue. The information will go to the thalamus at the base of the brain. It's processed a little bit there before it gets to the actual occipital lobe. What do I mean by field of view? Well, it's pretty much what you would expect. We've got an image here that shows the wiring of the retina to the visual cortex of the occipital lobe. So again, that's at the back of the brain. If I draw a line right down the middle here between the eyes, we've got the left field of view to the left of that line, and we've got the right field of view to the right of that line. Now let's imagine that we have an object off over here. So way out in right field, so to speak. It's going to reflect light, and the light is going to travel to both of the eyes like this. But notice that that light is going to be perceived or sensed, I should say, by the left portion of the retina. It can't physically get to the right portion of the retina. So this area um, here, let me use a different color here, this area over here of the retina won't receive any light and the same over here. Now notice how things are wired so that half of the fibers, half of the axons cross over. So all the information from the left side of the retina, which is due to stimulation by something in the right field of view, is all going to make its way to the left occipital lobe. Another view of the same thing uh, with a bit more detail, but again, the, the take home message here is that half of the axons are going to cross over at the optic chiasm so that we can bundle together all the information from the left field of view and from the right field of view and keep them separate. And that information crosses over to the opposite side of the brain, ultimately going to the visual cortex of the occipital lobe. Now notice that the information passes through the thalamus and within the thalamus we have connections with cranial nerve 3 which is the ocular motor nerve and I already mentioned that that's involved in moving the eyes, sensing movements of the head, allowing movements of the eye to um, keep something in view as the head moves. Hopefully you remember from Bio 111 some of the areas of the brain and what those areas do. We're just interested in two right now, the visual cortex and the visual association area. So the visual cortex is where information is first received after it's been relayed through the thalamus. The information that's coming in is stuff like color, uh, intensity, that kind of thing. The visual association area is going to put that information together. So it's going to use that information to build shapes um, and to you know, build objects, basically, and also to build some information about changes in shapes. Let's say you're standing in the road and you've got a truck coming towards you and it's quite a ways away. It looks quite small. As it gets closer towards you, of course, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the visual association area is what's initially responsible for the recognition that that shape is getting larger. 
Now that information is going to go to your prefrontal cortex and your prefrontal cortex is going to scream at you, holy crap, there's a truck coming at you, get off the road. So we have information coming to the visual cortex. That information is being processed initially in the visual association area, and then signals are being sent to the prefrontal cortex, which is where cognition and thought occurs. And that's where you decide what you're going to do about this information you're receiving. Lots of cool stuff going on in the visual association area. It's just using raw data that it gets from the visual cortex and it's making a story out of that. It's putting the pieces together and trying to make it make sense. So you can see the first example here on the left, we know, or at least we expect to know, the size of an apple. And we've got an image here where we've got apples that are getting smaller as we go front to back. And your brain, your visual association area, will perceive that as the apple in the back is not actually smaller, it's just further away. Now, as you realize, you can trick your brain. Uh, you could lay out some apples with apples that are physically smaller in the front, and you can trick your brain into thinking they're all uh, the same distance from you and stuff like that. You can do cool things to trick your visual association area. The second example, imagine that you're walking down a sidewalk, you've got a fence that's very close to you, you've got um, some buildings and trees that are further away. As you walk, the angles between you and the fence are going to change more than the angles between you and the buildings, and that fence is going to appear to move much more quickly than the buildings. And the visual association area is going to put that together to mean the buildings are further away. That's another type of cue that you have to know how far things are away. If you just move around, it helps your brain figure that out. And then also um, stereo vision. So we've got the left field of view and the right field of view, and we put that together and we get a stereoscopic image. It helps us form three-dimensional relationships between objects. So we can trick one of these forms of perception, but all together, typically they work pretty well. If we're picking up on these three different cues, for instance, we can get a pretty good idea of how close and how far away things are. Finally, I just very briefly want to talk about colorblindness. If you have colorblindness, it means that some of the cones are either not there, they didn't form, or they're defective, they're not working correctly. And the most common is red-green color blindness, and that's what you're seeing a depiction of here. So at the top, we've got a green hat, a yellow shirt, and red sneakers. And that's what most people would be able to see. So someone who doesn't have color blindness would see that. If you have red-green color blindness, you would see what's at the bottom. So they're slightly different shades of yellow in this particular case. Color blindness comes in different forms depending on which cones are having issues and how severe those issues are. This condition is more common in males and the reason for that is that the genes that are responsible for the development of cones are found on the X chromosome. Now females have two X chromosomes so if you have one X chromosome that has problems you have one X chromosome with some malfunctioning or defective genes, you might be okay because you have another X chromosome as a backup and your um, the enzymes and so on in your nucleus can read the genes on the functional X chromosome, turn those into proteins, turn them into opsin and so on. Uh, incidentally, it's quite often opsin that is the problem. Now, if you're male, you only have one X chromosome. So if you got a bad copy of those genes from your mother, you don't have another X chromosome to offset the effects. There's a little figure there in the bottom left corner. If you're not colorblind, you should be able to see that as 74. Um, if you can't, I'm really sorry that you learned it this way, but you should be able to see the number 74. And finally, here is the terminology list for both A and B, both parts of topic one. These are the terms I expect you to know. On a midterm or quiz, 
I could potentially ask you to define these terms. You should be able to define them in your own words. In fact, you should be able to explain these things to someone. If you can do that, if you can explain what one of these terms means to, I don't know, your parents, someone that uh, is not in biology, then that to me means that you understand it. If they can understand you when you explain it, you probably understand it. So focus on these terms. These are the terms that you are responsible for. These are terms that might show up in matching questions. They might show up in multiple choice questions and so on. As I think I mentioned before in my introduction, when I compose my tests, I look at these terminology lists, I have them all in front of me, and uh, I use them as a guide to make my questions.